The last few videos here we've talked about Manson's earlier life, his first wife, his first kid. When Manson first got arrested in the Heller Skelter thing, and he came to Los Angeles and he first appeared in front of a judge, NBC, of course, was broadcasting that live that night on the evening news. In a Los Angeles court today, Charles Manson, charged in the murder of Sharon Tate and six others, told the judge he did not want a lawyer to plead his case, that he wanted to plead his own. The judge spent an hour trying to talk him out of it, but failed, and finally he agreed to let Manson, when he is tried, represent himself. Not only was he starting off wanting to be his own attorney from the very start, they did sort of an expose of his life that day on that Christmas Eve. They started telling about where he came from, where he grew up, those sort of things. McMechan, West Virginia, is one of the many little mill and mining towns that cling to hills along the Ohio River. Most people here don't remember Charles Manson, but this was the closest thing he had to a hometown when he was growing up. He lived with an aunt and uncle in this house. Manson never knew his father. His mother was a prostitute who spent time in prison. School records in McMechan show Manson was an average student in the second, third, and fourth grade. If you ask me, this is right where the Manson legend begins. The infamy of Charles Manson is right here. They started calling his mother a prostitute. And if you go and you look at any public record, any law record, any official record, there's not one time that she ever got arrested for prostitution. Not one time. But they continued to call her a prostitute pretty much all her life. He began with his mother, who was still a prostitute. In this neighborhood in Indianapolis, he had his first brush with the law for stealing a bicycle and then a car. He was 14. I've heard it probably a dozen times myself, probably read it in the book, but Vince Bugliosi once said, Charles Manson was so institutionalized, he didn't even know how to ride a bike. Wait a minute. He was arrested for stealing a bike. What did he do, push it? Again, more legend. Let the legend begin right here. He was 14. Manson's mother deserted him. At the urging of a Catholic priest, he was sent to Boys Town, where he lasted three days before stealing a car and burglarizing a supermarket. He was sent to the Indiana Boys School, the state reform school. He wouldn't conform to the rules and was moved from one dormitory to another. Manson compiled 28 bad conduct reports in two years. At one point, he was barred from Catholic church services. Then he complained he was being discriminated against. His IQ was rated then at 104, but he failed the eighth grade. That was the last of his formal schooling. Kind of throw that in there nonchalantly where they say Manson's mom deserted him. And then he was sent, he, they got that out of order for one thing. Manson's mom did desert him. She is the first, she's, she's the first reason why he went into a boy's home. She sent him there. She paid to have him go there. Perhaps 20 years ago, a chronic discipline problem, even at that time. He was a very average student, uh, a very poor quality work. He showed very little, if any, interest in school work. And of course, when they're doing these exposés, I mean, mind you now, he's, on tri he's going on trial for Helder Skelter. And they go back to ask somebody in his past to was in charge of him in some boy's home, of course they're going to say, oh yeah, he was a bad kid, yeah, I knew it. They always do. I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty. Interest in school work. How was he regarded by the other boys? The other students uh, seemed to regard him as a boy they uh, liked to mingle with. Uh, Manson seemed to have a lot of stories to tell that was of interest to the other boys. No, I can attest to that. If I would have been in the boys' home, I would have probably sat there and listened to Manson talk, too, because he tells some damn good stories. The file on Manson at the reform school shows he escaped five times. There are letters there from his aunt and grandmother in which they write of their love for him and their hopes that he would do better. There are also postcards written by Manson to schoolmates while he was free on his last escape. He urged them to stay in and then get out the right way. Well, I can only imagine what those postcards would be worth right now. A few thousand dollars. When he was 16, his character and personality were evaluated by teachers here. The consensus was he was self-centered, generally lazy, cooperated only under pressure, and had little influence on other people for either good or bad. 
Manson, at age 16, was placed in a federal reform school. He stayed there until he was 20. When he was released, he went back to McMechan, worked at a few odd jobs, and a few months later, he was married here to a 17-year-old girl. They moved into a house across the street. Manson's wife had a baby, but before it was born, he was in trouble with the law again, arrested for driving a stolen car to California. That was in 1955. Well, now they've made it up to the part of the story that we were talking about the other day when I told Joe I was talking to Manson about his first wife. I have a little bit of that. Let's listen to me and Manson talk about his first wife, Rosalie Willis. Uh -huh. Yeah, I just, I don't, I, you sent me the email. I don't know if you ever got the picture, but I got the picture. I just sent it to you in the mail, the wedding picture that you were in. You were standing in front of a cake. Do you know you? Who, do you? Yeah, you're 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 a cute young guy standing there with a, a woman. She's in a dress. You're in a suit, and you're in front of a wedding cake, and it looks like you just got married. Do you remember getting married? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she ended up Bruce Willis. Yeah. Her name was Rosalie Willis. Yeah. She's she's actually from Benwood. That was the first time. Benwood's a little town. Huh? That was the first time I ever seen her picture. She's a pretty she's a pretty girl. Yeah, I know, I know. Right? Yeah, well, I, I, I lived all up and down that valley. I lived in Steubenville for about a year and a half. I lived in a place called uh, Wellsville down the river, and then I was born in East Liverpool that was right on it. This call and your telephone number will be recorded and monitored. Yeah. When Manson would be telling me these stories, it would just be like, two guys out on the back porch. I remember when I was a kid, older guys telling stories just like Manson would tell. He's telling a story now about Benwood. Benwood was a pretty famous place in itself because of the fact his wife was born there. There was also a huge mine disaster there that you can read on the plaque. It's a bend in the river where the riverboat was flowed down and they were, uh, when I was chugging to get around that bend, it would slow down real slow and then throw a wood on the boat. They just throw big old hunks of wood on the boat. They used to call it thin wood. Oh, really? You're driving next to the big Mac and, and war wood. I got little towns all up down the river there. Yeah, I know. Bunch of crazy people who live in them, too. As you've seen on the map on the on the video, me and Manson didn't grow up that far from each other. I mean, he was 30-something years older than me, so he was gone by the time I was growing up. But Wellsville and McMeachin, they were next-door neighbors, right across the river from each other, basically. He, he went to a Nazarene church in McMeachin. I went to a Nazarene church where I lived, not that far apart. And the people there, we knew a lot about the people. The people there, there are some strange characters going on. Yeah, I know. They didn't like Catholics or whatever. Yeah, they um, they don't like anything. I mean, if you walk into a town, just, they don't like drinking beer. They don't like nothing in them places. Yeah, I know. Everybody. You see their cars moving. You see shadows at night, but you don't even know who lives next door most of the time. Yeah, I know. I know. Oh, when NBC gets back into their story, they start talking about Manson going to San Francisco and the house that he lived in in San Francisco. Uh, I've showed that on video, and plenty of people have showed that on video. But they also talked to the guy that he lived with inside that house in San Francisco. That guy's name was Michael Toot. He was a priest. He lived with a nun there. And Charles Manson and the girls lived with this guy that they're about ready to talk to on NBC. He lived with the guy there. For the next 12 years, it was one prison after another for auto theft, forgery, white slavery. 
In his last years in prison, Manson began studying offbeat religions. He read books on influencing people, and he took an interest in music. In March of 1967, he was released on parole and moved into San Francisco's Haight Ashbury, where nobody cared about his prison record, girls were his for the taking, and where an ex-con could pose as a musician and get lost in the hippie crowd. He lived here for a time, 636 Cole Street, where the group that was known later as Manson's family began to gather around him. His admirers were numerous. One of them, who did not want his face shown, talked about the hold that Manson had on his followers. He'd been out of jail for approximately a year at that time and uh, had uh, a school bus, big black school bus. He had uh, a couple of cars. He had, uh, oh, at least a dozen girls around him. He had a number of guys. Um, had influential friends, some of whose names have, you know, have already come out, some of whom haven't. Um, and he, you know, just had a way with people that, that seemed to show, you know, what he was saying was right. Uh, he was, you know, a very charismatic individual. I guess some people have called it magnetic, and some people say they, that they were hypnotized. Um, but he was just a very, very charismatic individual. So those were a couple of videos that I was watching, and I thought, eh, you might like to see them too. Hope you did. Hope you could learn something from them. I thought it was kind of cool looking back in time on the way they used to report things. A lot of things that they said, I think uh, they exaggerated them a bit. They started those lies right off the bat with the prostitution thing, with a woman who was never a prostitute in her life. That's just sad to me. The way they treated women back then, all a woman had to do was go out with two guys, and you know what? That's what they called her. Times sure have changed since then. And until next time, we come back to do some other video about something to do with all this stuff I've collected. I've got a lot of stuff. And I can shock you with some videos. Some of them are coming. I'm going to tell you some things you've never heard before in your entire life. And until then, peace.